Now, from our Washington headquarters, here's David Brinkley. Is this country ready for self-government? Can it manage its own finances? Well, certainly not now. This week, the president's own economic advisors put out a report saying something quite different from what he is saying. And their report was publicly disowned. Congress was advised to throw it in a trash can. Quite a little scene. We'll explore it all today. Our guests were to include Martin Feldstein, chairman of the president's economic advisors, but about 24 hours ago, he withdrew, apparently under White House pressure. With us today, Senator Pete Domenici of New Mexico, Republican, chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, Representative James Jones of Oklahoma, Democrat, chairman of the House Budget Committee, Felix Rowerton, investment banker, chairman of New York City's Municipal Assistance Corporation. The background on this crazy week from our man, John Martin. And our discussion here with George Will, Sam Donaldson, and Jody Powell, all here on our Sunday program. First, today's news since the Sunday morning papers. In Lebanon, President Jamal accepted the resignation of his entire cabinet. The plan is to install a new one representing all the factions in Lebanon in the hope of ending the seemingly endless civil war. The prime minister resigned along with the others and called for canceling the withdrawal agreement with Israel because he said Israel still occupies Lebanese territory. The Marines in Lebanon came under fire again this morning, went on full alert for a time, nobody hurt. The Space Shuttle Challenger launched a satellite belonging to Western Union and lost it in space. It has another one aboard belonging to Indonesia. After some hesitation because of the first failure, Indonesia has asked to have its satellite launch tomorrow morning. This morning, the Challenger released a balloon for practice in moving around in space and chasing the balloon. But the balloon, when it inflated itself from a tank, exploded. We'll be back with all the rest of today's program in a moment. This week with David Brinkley, brought to you by Archer Daniels Midland Company. You probably already know that lead is a poison. But do you know where 90% of it that's deposited in the atmosphere comes from? Right here. Fortunately, there's unleaded gasoline and lead-free octane boosters like ethanol. They can reduce the amount of lead in the air. And that's good news for everyone, because lead is something we can all live without. America, land of instant gratification. The only trouble is American business wants profits delivered like overnight packages and economic solutions served up like instant pudding. We've never looked for instant answers at W.R. Grace. Short-term thinking just isn't our way of doing business. If we all want long-lasting results, we must give our plans time to develop. At W.R. Grace, we want all of us to stay one step ahead of a changing world. It has been a sort of circus here at Washington this week. An economic report sent to Congress in the president's name, fine, but for the fact the report disagrees with his economic views and his secretary of the treasury recommending to congress that the report be thrown in the trash the disagreement of course is about how to deal with a federal budget two hundred billion dollars in the red spending two hundred billion the government does not have john martin has some background on all this the anger pride hurt feelings mutterings in the white house hallways john there are really four documents, the budget and the appendix and the special analysis and the budget in brief. 2,014 pages of tables and charts and plans. Almost everybody in Washington has one of these now, but almost nobody knows what to do with them. Forgetting the numbers, what they boil down to is this. The president wants to spend more this year, but can't cover expenses with what's coming in. He says he doesn't want to raise taxes, but that something should be done something now and something after the election. There are going to be some tough bullets to bite. Now, there is no point in lining up all of these uh, uh, changes or proposals in a row so that every candidate running for office in the House and the Senate 
and maybe elsewhere, can pledge not to do them. But unless somebody cuts spending or raises taxes or both before the election, the government will have to borrow a lot of money to pay its bills. How much? About a fifth of the budget. That's far more than any president has ever needed to borrow. It is one of the most unbalanced budgets in American history. By 1983, we will have a balanced budget, and that will bring the end to inflation. And from then on, we will be collecting surpluses, which we can return to the people in more tax cuts that are needed. After he won the election, the president got Congress to cut taxes two years ago to stimulate growth. It has, but not enough. He also asked Congress to cut some non-military spending. It did, but not enough. Partly because he also asked Congress to spend a lot more on defense. It did, but possibly too much. Can you honestly say that there are no major weapon systems that can be cost-effectively halted? The 13% real growth asked for in this budget for defense is inappropriate, that we can't afford it. I've attempted to keep this issue from being totally politicized by supporting the creation of a bipartisan working group from the Congress. The group will work with the administration on making a down payment on the deficit. But one thing is certain, raising taxes and threatening the recovery is no answer. But what then is negotiable? How seriously does the administration view the deficits? And who speaks for it? Everything is negotiable this time. We expect there to be a trimming down in the uh, proposed defense outlays in this budget. We expect there to be more tax revenue than is in this budget. A day later, a White House official warned reporters only to listen to the president. And when Dr. Feldstein's economic report was cited to Treasury Secretary Donald Regan... Uh, as far as I'm concerned, you can throw it away. But the puzzle persists. Secretary Regan views the borrowing gap without alarm. Budget Director Stockman views it with alarm. We're in the same position that many companies are in when they're on the eve of Chapter 11. I've never seen a document that, that, that is being run away from by so many people who put it together in my life. And I don't think the financial markets will respond positively uh, to uh, this kind of a budget as a serious attempt to reduce the deficits. The markets did falter this week on reports of massive trade deficits and the feeling, perhaps, that the cost of borrowing and business will rise catastrophically if government must borrow so much for itself. Something should be done this year before election rather than waiting until after, and the markets are sitting on pins and needles. But we don't really know. We haven't had experience of these kinds of deficits. Respected liberal economist Robert Reich at Harvard says that even though the deficits are so big, they probably will be damaging and must be trimmed, they are helping end the recession. It's a classic Keynesian stimulus to the economy, and so for now, it may not be a bad thing at all. And just across from the White House here at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, they are bullish on America, of course, and bemused that their prediction of current high growth was more accurate than all those warning of doom. The president's own chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors did not forecast the growth that we saw here at the chamber, and I think the majority of the business community saw. The chamber predicts even higher growth this coming year, but that is not the conventional no, view here this week, and the idea of compromise is in the air. The future is literally slipping from our grasp, and if we don't do something now, it is over. But when it's all said and done and we make our political judgments and moves, I hope we're going to repair to back rooms and make some deals. One deal suggested by a leading Democrat is to cut the deficit by twice as much as the Republicans want to. But that would probably mean deep slashes in defense and a steep increase in taxes. So this week, at least seven men will try to meet secretly here at the Capitol to see whether a deal can be made. On the guest list so far, one man from the White House, two Democrats, one from each House, and four Republican senators, all trying to decide whether they can afford a down payment on the deficit before the election and before the country moves any closer to what some here see as ruin and others see as recovery. David? John, thank you. Coming next from New York, Felix Roatan, investment banker, senior partner in Lazard Frere, and one of the most respected figures in the financial community, in a moment.
Monday in ABC News UPI investigation, the sky-high cost of congressional overseas travel. It's an outrage and an insult to the American taxpayer. Hundreds of thousands of dollars spent each year on air travel never show up on the public record. Monday, watch ABC's World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Mr. Rowerton, thanks very much for coming in. We're pleased to have you with us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Here with me are George Will of ABC News and Sam Donaldson, ABC News White House correspondent. Mr. Rowerton, you know the controversy we are discussing here. What, in your judgment, will, will happen, would happen, if nothing were done, which seems a fairly likely prospect? Well, I think you, we're living in a very high-risk environment uh, at this point. The, there's no question that the deficits have uh, created this recovery that we're in uh, with great assistance from the Federal Reserve, which eased the money supply. But we're looking at a, at a budget and at a financial plan that was submitted this week, uh, which is really not a serious document at best. I mean, if everything happens the way it is uh, hoped it would happen, we would increase our borrowing over the next four or five years by somewhere between uh, three quarters of a trillion dollars and a trillion dollars. And since the federal government borrows forever because it never pays back any of its debt, it means that we're looking at, a, at an increase simply in interest cost, potentially, of some 75 to 100 billion dollars per annum over this period. Uh, this is just not, a, this is not an acceptable or a serious uh, perspective. Now, I said I think this is kind of a best case <coughs> Uh, scenario and uh, the really troublesome thing about this uh, financial plan is the lack of any kind of downside uh, contingency plan I mean what happens if in the middle of this or next year or 18 months from now we go into a recession uh, with a hundred and eighty or two hundred billion dollar deficit going in the door and are then looking at three hundred or three hundred and fifty billion dollars deficit in a recession uh, at a time when uh, when financial markets are, are in turmoil, when the third world debt is a real problem, uh, we're going into financial outer space here. And we're going into it with a crew, with a, a level of dissension among the people uh, making this country's financial policy that is at a level that I've never seen before. Mr. Rowett, and that dissension can be characterized, I guess, like this. Uh, David Stockman says that we're in the position of a firm going into Chapter 11, that is, into bankruptcy. Yet the supporters of the president's budget, whoever they are, say that, in fact, if the situation were as bad as the people say it is, people like uh, you, for example, then the market signals would be picking this up and the markets would be in turmoil. Why aren't they? Well, first of all, the markets are getting very nervous. Uh, secondly, I didn't say that we were in a crisis right now. On the contrary, I think we're in a situation right now where we can afford to do the things that would set this recovery on a long-term, low inflationary kind of path uh, without running the risk that we're running. I don't know to, how to predict the future, but I do know that nobody else knows how to predict the future. Especially, as I said, since we're, we're traveling a road that nobody's ever traveled before in terms of the level of the national debt, in terms of the international monetary system, in terms of a lot of things that that none of us have experienced before. I think we're in a position right now to do some major things to make sure that this keeps up. Now, it has to involve a lot of difficult sacrifices and a lot of difficult and unpleasant decisions, but they're not going to be any more pleasant next year. In fact, they're going to be less pleasant because you will have added another $200 billion to the national debt in the meantime. Mr. Royton, even people in the administration who uh, disagree with much of what you've just said acknowledge that there's a problem, but think that it can be put off. And you yourself have just said that at the moment, we aren't in grave danger, it's down the road. Look down the road and give us a time. Can we wait till next year to really make major decisions on the budget? Well, I think we can if we want to run the risk. Uh, you know, I live in a world of, of, of uncertainty, but I live in a world where I have to evaluate risk. And uh, there is a level of risk that in business is unacceptable, and that's called betting the company. Uh, we're in the process of betting the company, because if by any chance something goes wrong in the next year or 18 months, uh, then we're going to have to face a set of circumstances that is, as I said, is, is, is totally unforeseeable and is, is totally unprecedented. And why run the risk when you All can right. do the thing now? All right, tell us precisely what we should do. Tell us where we should cut. Tell us how much taxes we should raise. Lay it out. 
Well, I think, uh, first of all, I think that's why we have uh, public officials that we elect uh, to do those things for us. But certainly the notion of, of a hundred billion dollar three-year down payment on, on what is a, a problem four or five times the size is, is, is an aspirant. Uh, I think that what we ought to do is at least double that. And uh, in a shorter period, maybe in a two-year period, and if that means taxes, I would support taxes in the in the energy areas, in the gasoline areas, uh, uh, much more uh, steeply than anything we're doing. I would support a minimum corporate income tax because I don't think you can keep corporations from uh, at the low level that uh, that they're presently at. I would support a change in the in the income tax system where you have a simplified, uh, graduated uh, three-level tax like. Uh, Bradley Gephardt with a maximum of say 28, 30 percent, at which point I think you can drop indexing. The only thing that's like a business in the government is the Department of Defense, and I've never seen a business yet that can't cut its budget 10 percent without beginning to touch the reality of the, what the business is. And in terms of the social entitlement program, sacrifices are going to have to be made, and that's what elected officials are for. Mr. Rowton, is there any Democrat out there who is approaching uh, what you would consider prudence and sense and imagination on this subject? Who's coming closest? I don't know that, uh, I don't know that, uh, uh, George, and I'm not sure that we're not way beyond the point of Democrats and Republicans. I think for this to happen, uh, Democrats and Republicans are going to have to be serious about working together and sharing the blame and sharing the sacrifice just as business and labor are going to have to be serious about doing things together in the midst of an extraordinary industrial revolution, and just as we're going to have to be serious in leading the Western world into a stabilization of the monetary system and the world debt system. I don't think this is any more a question of any one man, any one ideology, or any one party. I think we're, we're way beyond that. Mr. Orton, you say we're traveling a road we have never traveled before. Think about this. This country is traveling a road that no other country has ever traveled before. It has a huge and expensive welfare state. It has a huge and expensive debt. It has a huge and expensive military. I don't know any country that ever had that combination before, do you? And no. If, wh where do you think it might lead? But we're also the richest country in the world. We're the best educated country in the world. We have the country with the stablest uh, political system. Uh, we've been through lots of difficult things, uh, I mean, on a very small scale, if you will. Uh, I saw what happened in New York City uh, in 1975 when the city almost went bankrupt for exactly the same reasons that the federal government is about to go bankrupt. And we did all kinds of things that were supposedly impossible politically because we had a very <coughs> strong governor, we had a very serious attempt at bipartisanship. We had business labor cooperation, and everybody shared in paying the price. And you had the federal government to help bail you out. But no, Sam, we had the federal government come in for a very little piece at practically no risk, which will be repaid <coughs> to the last cent. And that is, again, a very important point you're making, is that the federal government has to play a role in all of these things. That doesn't mean it's a bailout role, but it has to cooperate. The federal government has to be a little more active a player on the scene here than simply somebody who delivers missiles or who delivers the mail. Mr. Rowerton, thank you very much for coming in. We've enjoyed hearing your thoughts this morning. It was a pleasure. Coming next, Senator Pete Domenici, Republican, chair Chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, and Representative James Jones, Democrat, Chairman of the House Budget Committee. In a moment. Senator Domenici, Congressman Jones, thanks very much for coming in. Delighted to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to ask you the same question I asked Mr. Rowerton a minute ago and see how your answer compares. What, what do you think will happen if, as is probably likely, we do absolutely nothing or next to nothing? What do you think will happen? Well, I, I agree with him. I think uh, there are great risks involved, uh, but I don't think anything's going to happen uh, till 85, 86 time frame. I do believe, however, that uh, we ought to do the prudent thing and begin with uh, some significant effort to reduce that deficit. Now, a lot's being said about the fact that the president isn't asking for a huge deficit reduction. But let me suggest, without uh, that bipartisan group getting together, I don't think we'll get the president's budget adopted in terms of deficit reduction. I think the deficits will be higher, not lower. Uh, it's a practical thing to get started. I wish we could do more, but basically I think it's a good approach, prudent approach, to get started with uh, the president's cuts, 
and maybe another 30 or 40 billion dollars over three years and lay the foundation uh, for a beginning five or six year game plan starting next year. But you're not absolutely certain that's going to happen. But I don't well, think there's... anyone's certain. Uh, uh, in, let in me say, matters. Jones, what, what well, will happen if we do nothing? Well, first of all, I hope that the conventional wisdom is wrong. Conventional wisdom being that nothing will happen. I think something needs to happen this year in terms of significant deficit reduction. Otherwise, our forecasts have been uh, <coughs> the same for the last uh, almost year and a half, and that is sometime between mid-1984 and the end of 1985, that clash between private borrowing demands, which grow as the economy recovers, will, will fall behind and clash with federal borrowing demands, and interest rates are going to go up. There is no way we can continue an economic recovery in a climate of high interest rates and growing interest rates. And so if we want to avoid another recession, it seems to me that we're going to have to act this year, and we're going to have to be serious about it. Senator, um, let me say that yeah. sounds very good, but I, I repeat, uh, uh, this isn't all the president's problem. Uh, I would submit that the Congress would not adopt the changes that are even in his budget uh, this year, an election year. I think they'll make a lot of noise, but unless they get themselves together and, and say, let's do something, uh, nothing will happen. I, I wish more would happen. Well, Senator, you're the only Republican here this morning because the administration did not want to send someone out to defend this budget, a budget in which the assumptions are, some people think, not just wrong, but cynical and dishonest. Now, that's fairly the assumptions, serious. you say? Yes, about From deficits going on, up sure. and, and interest rates falling, for example. Okay. Given the fact, now, you are a senior Republican in the Senate. The fundamental job of an administration is to present a budget for the government. This administration can't do it. Why isn't it fair for the country to say the Republicans are not ready to govern? Oh, let me suggest, uh, I don't think this president has lacked for courage. We've made some dramatic changes. Is this a courageous budget? <clears throat> this is a realistic budget, not a courageous budget. Very realistic. You mean politically realistic? Uh, well, you know, not you don't, economically realistic. Yeah, you, don't, you don't disassociate politics from reality in our country. You get things done by politics, and this is a, a politically sound budget. I want to cut the deficit more, and I will propose more. Why but I will be happy if we get this plus a little bit in this election year. Why isn't it fair to say, using Mr. Royton's words in one sense, that the president is betting his re-election against the country, against the store? No, I think the, uh, I think the president is, is suggesting, and, and those uh, who, who want to help him, incidentally, I've proposed much larger deficit reduction plans, so has Chairman Jones. Uh, there's a lot of mouthing going on, but Congress didn't want to, didn't want to reduce them more. On the one hand, they want to reduce taxes a lot more. On the other hand, they want to reduce defense substantially. But nobody really came up with anything that would work. Uh, I don't think the president is, is betting his reelection against the, the economics. I think it's realistic to listen to economists. They're saying you're going to have to reduce deficits over five, six, seven years. Get on with it. And he's saying, I challenge you. Here's $100 billion. He's the president. Well, why didn't he send up a budget that had all of that in it? Well, I'm suggesting that he is appropriately weary and leery of the United States Congress. He's appropriately weary and leery, uh, and he has the right at this point in history, with inflation down and all the other good things happening, to say, let's, let's do a little bit and wait and see. Mr. Jones, pick up on that point. Why don't the Democrats say, all right, we're going to join the president in getting into these entitlements programs this year, slipping the colas, cutting money from our various constituency groups, and say it's the right thing to do. Well, let me first of all say that as one Democrat, I've done that. I've done that for over a year now. You have, but Mr. Wright hasn't. Mr. O'Neill hasn't. Well, I think you'll Mr. See, Bird hasn't. Mr. Wright has put on, uh, uh, he has already said that we ought to cut the deficits more than what the president recommended in his budget. We ought to double the deficit reduction package. Let me just say from the outset, and while I may have some disagreements with this administration's budget, and I agree with you that it's not a, a realistic budget in terms of what we ought to be doing, uh, this is, got, this is uh, larger than just one political party's problem. I think it has to be a joint effort. It has to be a bipartisan effort. The, the, but the key to this bipartisan effort has got to be the president. Up to this point, the signals we get is that the defense reduction uh, or slowing the rate of growth of defense spending and a tax program cannot be a part of a bipartisan solution. And I think it's got to be a part. The Democrats have to put on the table domestic programs. 
and the defense and the taxes have to be put on the table if we're going to have a serious deficit reduction package. Congressman, actually, I think the president has proposed more tax increases than spending cuts in this budget. Not much of either, but a little bit more tax increases. One of the ones he's proposed is that some employer-paid health insurance programs be taxed as compensation. Now, we're arguing about here about what's realistic. Will Congress do that? That's a middle-class benefit. Will yeah. they trim it? Well, <clears throat> this was offered last year in Congress, and both political parties rejected it. Partly, they rejected it because it was only part of a health uh, cost containment program, and there needs to be a, a more comprehensive health cost containment program. What will happen this year, I think, depends on what the other parts of the package are. I don't rule it out uh, necessarily, although it's going to have a difficult task to to uh, stay in the budget. What's magic about 1985, by the way? I mean, we're never more than two years away from an election that involves 435 congressmen and 33 senators. Well, I think it's the beginning of a new presidential term, just being realistic. Uh, but, but let me suggest that in 1980, we were, we were working in some uncharted waters. We still are. Uh, we had interest at 21, inflation double digit, the American dollar falling off the table. There were many people, uh, suffering from the same kind of hysteria. It wasn't deficit hysteria then. It was just economic malaise hysteria. So what's new? We still got to some uncharted ground and uncharted water. And basically, it's these deficits. But look at the good things, enormously good things that have occurred. Uh, I'll give you a number. Uh, we now calculate on an average family buying food, just to give you an example of inflation. They will spend $68 a month less on food now than in 1980 just because of deflation. Now, that's a pretty good economic change. Uh, some of the risks that were there four years ago are gone. There are new ones. Can we get 10%, as Mr. Royton suggested, out of the defense budget, the $305 billion spending authority request? That'd be about $30 billion. Can we get that? In, in one year? Yes. No. What do you think? We can get uh, somewhere between uh, 12 and 18 billion, a little more than half of what you suggest. Mr. Jones, what about that's it? That's about right. If you did what Congress, uh, in a bipartisan way, agreed to last year, you'd reduce the defense budget about <coughs> $16 billion from the president's request in you one think, year. You think he'll stand still for that? He and Mr. Weinberger? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, we're getting all kinds of uh, stories about the waste and inefficient spending of, of the Pentagon budget. And I think the American people will say that they can do with less, and I think Congress and the President ought to back that up. Let me interrupt just a minute. We'll be back with more questions for our two guests in a moment. Senator Domenici and Congressman Jones, President Reagan says that despite the deficit, raising taxes now would be damaging when we are coming out of a recession, which is generally thought, I think. But we are not always coming out of a recession with a huge deficit like this. And so a great many others, and I want to see if you are included, think a tax increase now is essential, now or well, soon. Let, let me just say, in by itself, no, it, it shouldn't be done. But in conjunction with spending reductions, I think it needs to be done. If you take a look at 1982, a, a tax increase coupled with some spending reductions, coupled with a, an easing of monetary policy, was what really brought on this recovery from the deepest recession we had. And so I think tax increases in this particular climate, coupled with spending reductions, are absolutely necessary if we're going to uh, reduce the deficits and have prospects of long-term recovery. Are you confident that Congress will keep that deal if made? President Reagan was talking on the radio last night, said with the TEFRA Act of 1982, was it? Uh, they said they'd get three dollars in increased taxes for every increased income, for every dollar of tax increase, uh, spending cuts, I mean. You said they didn't get any of it. Well, that's, that's not exactly accurate, and, and that was that's disproven. Well, I think uh, his speechwriters have gotten some mistakes. Senator Domenici and Senator Dole, uh, who would have been a party to any kind of agreement, have uh, said that there was no agreement. The, the agreement, as far as Congress was concerned, was to, writ, was to uh, cut spending $1.39 for every dollar of tax increases, and Congress achieved 90% of that. Uh, the rest of it were economic assumptions and things the president, or within the administration's own... Uh, Let me say, uh, no president under our given system of spending money and taxing can get a 
ironclad commitment. When you reduce taxes or raise them, that stays in the structure generally, uh, while spending goes on much of it year to year. So you can get some relationship of commitment, but you can't get five or ten years of, of commitment. With reference to the last uh, budget where we raised some taxes and made some very significant cuts, uh, I disagree with the President. Uh, the facts are, as we have them, that 80 percent of what Congress committed to by way of budget cuts, they did. Now, what happened is other things went up, but the things they agreed to cut, they cut, which is basically what I'm describing to you in terms of uh, if you're going to wait around to get a one for one and say it's five years, then you're asking that the entire process of running this government be changed, and that won't happen. Congressman, uh, we have to pay the interest. Let's assume you can get, you can't, you say, but let's assume you can get 10% out of the defense budget. That's $30 mm -hmm. billion. Dollars. Discretionary social spending is now a pretty small part of the budget. Yeah, it's been right. gone over by, with a rake several times. Question, can you begin to make the kind of down payment on deficit reduction without touching, in a fairly significant way, the middle class entitlement programs, Social Security and Medicare particularly? Well, I've said all along that non-means tested entitlement programs have to be on the table uh, to reduce the, the growth in their spending, the same as military growth and spending has to be reduced. And then that coupled with taxes have got to be the cornerstone of a deficit reduction package. Now, are you, do you think the conventional wisdom is right or wrong that you can't do that in 1984? Well, the conventional wisdom is that you can't do it. I don't necessarily believe that that's the case. I've talked to groups representing senior citizens and those who receive these pensions of entitlement programs, and uh, if it's a shared sacrifice, if it's across the board, if it's perceived to be fair, uh, they may not be jumping up and down for it, but if it's put in the context of saving this recovery for everybody, I think you'll find that it can be done. What? Let me Go answer ahead. just briefly. Uh, I don't think it can be done in 84. I think fundamental change is going to have to be made in 85 for a five or six year period. And that means fundamentally changing military procurement, not just little ways, but dramatically, fundamentally changing uh, social programs, looking at means tested, make sure you take care of the needy and, and get rid of some of the others. Uh, I think tax reform, uh, where, it's, where it's unfair, you fix it, and ultimately you're going to have to raise that base a little. Uh, that's the only way to get to that deficit, but you're going to have to do them all. What, what's to be done about Martin Feldstein? Here the president is running for re-election, saying he has built a beautiful economic house and the chairman of his own council of economic advisors running around saying it's on fire, it's about to burn down unless we do something. Should the well, president simply ask him to leave? No. Well, I, 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 think, I think that's an internal matter, but every reputable economist will tell you, will back up Dr. Feldstein, and that is that unless the deficits come down, those rosy projections from 1986 onward simply cannot uh, uh, exist in a climate of high deficits. Well, Mr. Jones and Senator Domenici, you both run for election. You both have staff. If one of the major players on your staff is running around saying, my boss's programs are all wet, someone must fix them, how can you tolerate that? Well, let me suggest, I had, uh, I had him before my committee for three and a half hours. Now, you reported the day before activities, but well, we I showed had his there. own words. Yes. We showed his own words, Senator. Uh, but, I didn't report it. But I had the whole three hours of his testimony. And let me tell you, he is a staunch supporter of the president's program. He is a staunch advocate of the good things that have been accomplished and indicates this president did them. He says you've got to reduce deficits, but he's quick to say you can't do it with only taxes. He says you're going to have to reduce everything, including defense, and says if you can get the down payment this year, get started. Secretary of the Treasury says the same thing. So they're fighting about well, the theory of how you got the deficit. He told, he told to reporters that they didn't really want this budget in 85. They wanted to see something a lot more, which fits with what you said. But he also said we couldn't just grow our way out of the recession. And That's the president right. ran on something called supply-side economics. His whole theory has been cut the taxes, the business investment will multiply, and we will in fact generate new revenues so that we don't have to do any of the things that he says and you say we have to do. Well, there's no, no question in my mind we're not going to grow our way out of, this, uh, out of this deficit. The question is what do we do to make sure that the growth continues uh, as strong as possible with as low inflation as possible. And as I indicated, it's somewhat uncharted. 
Uh, we'll have to do some different things than we've ever done before. But there are a lot of good signs on the American economy well, that weren't there I hate before. to keep pressing this, but why would they uh, tell him he couldn't come on this broadcast uh, to express his views yeah. if his views were so much in line with the president? Frankly, I think the Secretary of the Treasury uh, overreacted, got very upset about something. and. Uh, you mean when he said throw out the economic report that Dr. Phelps Yes, had when, when he got that far and said that, he probably also told the White House, uh, I, I don't like what he's saying. But if you listen to what he's saying in toto, um, he has a different theory of the future years and what the causes and effects are going to be. But for now, they're very close to what we ought to do, both of them. I, I think ask, what we ought to be doing ahead, is, is, is looking at the words of Dr. Felstein and, and uh, not uh, regard the personality. What we are doing, I'm afraid, is betting the company in that we don't know for sure when this clash of personal uh, private borrowing and public borrowing is going to hit. But we do know that capital investment is down. We do know that high interest rates are going to happen with these high deficits. We do know that without capital investment, uh, we cannot have the kinds of sustained productivity increases. And we do know that uh, in a climate of high interest rates, we're going to have an overvalued dollar, which hurts our exports. So it seems to me that we ought to exercise some political leadership. We ought to take the words of Dr. Feldstein and apply some political courage to it. And that's the best way to help this economy yeah. in the long if run. We, if it turns out we have to have a tax increase, something it already has, what kind would you want? What would you like? Well, I want, to, kind of I want to make an observation first, and then I'll, I'll answer quickly. To me, uh, this bipartisan group that the president's asked to meet uh, has a chance of succeeding. But if one side or the other goes into that, uh, trying to again take extreme political positions, uh, we haven't get anything done. For those that say we ought to do 200 billion worth of reductions, uh, let's see if they can honestly get 125 or 130 and are willing to go out and fight for it and support it both to the electorate and in, in, in their respective bodies. So I hope there's no hot dogging. I hope it's real. Now, how about the tax increase? Uh, from what from my is... standpoint, the, at this point, you can take the reform measures that uh, Senator Dole has suggested. He, he works hard on these, on these matters, and he has about 30 to 35 billion in, in various reform measures, loophole closures and the like. I would start with those for this year. If you're looking in the out years, I think you've got to look at something like energy. Uh, you've got to look at, at some broad tax that will yield a lot of money. Uh, the income tax is not going to be the major way to do it in the future, in my Mr. opinion. Mr. Jones, well, I think, you ought to, time I think you ought to have basic tax reform in 1985, but the quickest and easiest temporary uh, revenue increase would be to take President Reagan's own suggestions of last year and have a temporary surtax. Uh, that, coupled with the reforms that we've already accomplished in the House Ways and Means Committee, would put you well on your way with spending cuts to a serious deficit reduction. Senator Domenici, Congressman Jones, thanks very much. Thank you. It's been nice having you with us today. Thank, Thank you. you. Coming next, our little discussion here, and joining us will be commentator Jody Powell in a moment. I'd like to tie up the loose string on a subject we danced around with, never really settled. Jody, you were in the White House. Had there been a Feldstein there at the time, would Mr. Carter have fired him? I would hope so. Uh, we did on occasion uh, take that uh, that sort of action and not for that reason for that reason oh you did and uh, okay. there were uh, it's always hard to do you always do it later than you should uh, it always uh, and by the time you get around to it causes you more pain and suffering I certainly think that the administration would be better off and probably Mr. Feldstein too if, if they had made that decision in December. The problem Mr. Feldstein is a man of principle and many people feel he's a man who's right on economics he persists, despite warnings from Jim Baker, the chief of staff, and others, he persists in going public with his criticisms of Ronald Reagan's economic policy. Well, if I were Ronald Reagan, I would dispense with his services as a member of my staff right away. Well, he's not a politician, Sam. He's an academic. Yes, but if I were Ronald Reagan, I'd be the consummate politician. I'm running for re-election. I'm kind of running for my political life. And here I have one of my aides running around saying he's all wet. No, sir. Off with your head, Feldstein. George? Well, when he did send up the budget and said, this really isn't what we want, it's rather as though Melville had sent Moby Dick to the publisher and said, I really don't like the whale motif in here. Well, that's sort of the heart of the matter. Now, there is a problem, however, because Feldstein is required by law to speak about the economy. Now, if the president were to fire everyone 
who would hesitate to come out and defend this preposterous budget, you would solve the White House parking problem. Yes, but I don't some of them anyone. don't speak up about it. Those people but and they're I not required by law. The chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors is supposed to be not under oath. That, that's why the decision should yeah. have been made in December, December. Everybody knows what the law is. Everybody knew that come about four or five weeks from the last fuss, Fallison was going to be on the Hill. He was going to be, be uh, testifying. And he either was going to be put in a position of making himself look like a fool by uh, taking a dive or making the administration look very bad by saying what he believes. There's an element of high comedy in all this, but there's also a serious part of this. And it, there's, this is a kind of deep intellectual corruption being perpetrated by the White House. No one, no one that I know of, and I've looked for them, will defend the propositions put forward in there about increasing deficits but declining interest rates. Now, that's a fairly serious matter when a government puts forth a document that patently cynical. Yeah, but some people defend it on the will theory, which I agree with, and that is if you have money in your pocket and you have a job for the first time in a year or so, it doesn't matter to you whether it was a Keynesian recovery or a supply-side recovery. You defend the president. I'm saying there are certain places at which politics must stop, and submitting formal documents with preposterous premises uh, ought to be one so which, Ronald Reagan staff, signed his, which your own staff does not support. Hmm. Yeah, but Ronald Reagan signed his name to the budget. It's his budget. And he was, of course, First right in sending pages. his spokesman out on Friday to reaffirm the fact that it's his budget and he sticks by it. Well, well several members of the staff have told Well, me the that captain of the, of the, of the uh, Titanic was the last, he didn't leave the ship either. Before we leave the subject of money, I want to ask about a uh, statement the president made this past week in an interview with, I believe, the Wall Street Journal, in which he discussed uh, people uh, collecting welfare, some of whom uh, have been removed, I believe he said, because he thought they were not morally eligible and others because they were not technically eligible. Can somebody tell me what that means? What does that mean? Well, it's a an, it's an singularly infelicitous way of saying something moderately sensible, which is that an awful lot of the means-tested entitlement cuts that the president favored were cuts because he felt and some others felt that these were people well significantly above the poverty line honorable men and women can disagree about that but that's what he was trying to say the great communicator well i think the first I, time messed it up however. well i don't i don't even think beside the wording that the thought is right uh, george because the law is the law let's take the income tax law some people may think of this particular loophole that particular thing is morally wrong but would you argue that a person has no right to take advantage of the law? Well, if, I don't think so. If, if it didn't come as part of a pattern of these sort of, of, of statements about, there was also one this week about uh, the people that sleep on grates around our cities sleep there because they, uh, they want to sleep there. There is some truth in that too. But I would submit that what the president is saying, what he is trying to say with that, is not defensible as a truth. And there's a, a sort of a calculated uh, know-nothingism about these these sort of, of, of comments designed to undermine uh, support not just for the morally eligible but for the uh, ineligible but, but for people that really the, really the do man, need help. The man who takes an oath to uphold the laws of the United States does not have the right to decide which law he likes and which law he doesn't like. He has the right to express but his view he and he has the right to try to campaign for it to be changed. But, but when he suggests that people are not morally eligible and ought not to receive it, he's wrong. Well, but no, what he was saying is he, was, he wanted to change the law because he thought people were not morally, morally he eligible. He didn't say that. He may well, have meant that, but he didn't say it. Right, I want to bring up something that has absolutely nothing to do with the deficit, nothing to do with welfare, nothing, in fact, to do with Washington. <laughs> and this, isn't that a pleasure? Yes. Do you look forward to it? I won't know <laughs> anything about it, but go ahead. Well, all right. You can make up something. <laughs> in the state of New Hampshire, I saw some figures this week I thought were very interesting. The state of New Hampshire spends less on its state school system, the state itself, than any state in the Union. Locality, local towns, cities, townships make up some of the difference, but the financing is still very low. Teachers' salaries are very low. But New Hampshire's public school system produces the highest scholastic aptitude test scores in the United States. Now, what do you make of that? I don't know. That it is, it is indeed possible under certain circumstances to do more with less. The danger, however, is that we make that correlation into a general rule in which we say that uh, less support for education is always better. The people of New Hampshire, uh, for one thing, live in communities in which the, the parents and the, the people support the schools. We don't have that in a lot of places. They have much less in the way of the social and cultural problems than, than we find in, in many, many places around this country. And as you say, 
uh, the, the, the local support for the schools actually lifts mm -hmm. that, uh, their total expenditure per capita to about 28th in the nation, so Still, it's not quite a... And New Hampshire, I guess, is only Alaska uh, among the states, together with New Hampshire, has neither a sales tax nor an income tax. So they have to have a third ingredient, which are sort of tough parents, and I imagine that's the story. But isn't that, isn't that where we keep learning, that parents are important and... Uh... We had a little thing here in Maryland where, they, where I live, and they released a report that said Maryland students aren't writing as well as they should, and they blame too much television and too much time on the telephone. Well, again, the parents can control both if they're parents, so there is that. However, Jody has a good point here. I mean, there's not a one-to-one -one correlation between dollars spent and achievement gain. However... It's odd that the Reagan administration believes in the market and absolutely everything except teachers. The fact of the matter is that since women have, have now expanded job openings all over the economy, as they rightly should, we have lost a kind of captive population from which we used to get primary and secondary school teachers. I think this does, however, support the president's view to some extent that, of course, the home environment, the education that begins at home from the parents is important, and in New Hampshire, apparently, it works. Uh, Jody, however, has the point that elsewhere in the United States, in many very much non-New Hampshire type atmospheres, you don't have that home. You don't have those parents. What's the alternative then? Well, it's something other than just say, go back and learn at home. And there does, in fact, well, appear to be, even in New Hampshire, a correlation between how much is spent, including local support in various districts. The richer districts, the children tend to do better. Well, in a big city, the school your child goes to may be 10, 15 miles away. Where did you go to school when you were that age? I went to school in Wilmington, North Carolina. Well, what was it, money? What was what? Well, you're here. <laughs> You've uh, made a success of your life to some extent. We can uh, blame that on education, no, I suppose. No, I think uh, my parents were responsible, as I believe they probably are in this case. They push kids, they expect something of them, they demand something of them, right. discipline them. I, Anybody care to argue my, that My point? mother was also a school teacher in the school where I went, and I can guarantee you that puts an extreme amount of pressure on you. Didn't cut the I class very I often, did you? On, uh, on right, one more thing. The Democrats are making some noises about a resolution to force President Reagan to withdraw the Marines from Lebanon. Would they really dare do that? Risk the consequences? Well, they're not trying to... Whatever they may they be. They very carefully didn't uh, try to make it force of law. It's, no, a it's a resolution the president could ignore it, and he said this past week he, he's not going to pay any attention to it. But it does put pressure on him. Another turn of the screw. He's got to get the Marines out of there. I don't George? think he has to get the Marines out of there. I don't think at this point he should get the Marines out of there. I think the Democratic Party has, for the last 10 years or so, dined out on urging the United States to get out of places. Now they're down to, I guess, El Salvador and Lebanon and Oklahoma, next thing you know. Suppose we got out and the Syrians then promptly took over all of Lebanon, which I gather they could if they, they would the Russians' help if they wanted to. They would say it's not our fault, well, although it would in some measure be. Well, George, how do you ever measure a mistake then in foreign policy? If once you've made a mistake, you then must follow it through because to do otherwise would be to cut and run and somehow reduce your credibility. I note your premise and reject it. I do not think we can say at this point that it was a mistake to put the Marines in. Not originally under the original guidelines, but the situation changed. We've got a government coming apart over there. We have appeals now for the, for the army to defect, and, and, uh, which would be a, a very serious thing. The prime minister work. resigned this morning. It's All right. Thank you very much. We'll be back with a few words about a Washington snowfall of paper with charts, graphs, footnotes, and advice in a moment.